Thank you. Um, just a real quick disclosure, this study was funded by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So just a brief overview, we know that children with autism spectrum disorders are much more likely to have feeding problems than those without. Um, and the goal of this presentation is to highlight the importance of examining their micronutrient intake in these kids. So their food selectivity, we know they are more selective and they often have a preference for more processed foods, more starches, which often leads to minimal intake of proteins, fruits, vegetables. And the problem is, is that sometimes these things are overlooked because there may be more focus on other behaviors and other developmental concerns. And then also, sometimes depending on what they're eating and the amount of what they're eating, they may not actually be at risk for compromised growth. So they may be following a normal growth curve. However, we're seeing that these micronutrient deficiencies are still leading to severe medical problems. We're seeing scurvy, we're seeing rickets, we're seeing um, risk for obesity, hypertension, diabetes, so all these long-term medical complications. And then on top of that, we're also seeing increased medical costs, which we're also going to highlight in one of our cases. So when we proposed this um, poster, we had four kids um, with autism who completed our um, intensive feeding program at Michigan Medicine. We collected food records pre and post treatment and our dietitian analyzed these food records. And with the exception of one of the kids who ate fortified snack food, she actually ate like a cereal bar that was fortified. All kids had significant micronutrient deficiencies, but all had normal growth prior to treatment. So, and just a brief run through of our intensive program. Um, this is eight weeks long, typically. They come for five days a week, and they do three meals a day in our program. All treatment protocols are based in applied behavior analysis, and we individualize them for each child, but we typically use escape extinction, stimulus fading, systematic desensitization, those types of things. Our treatment is carried out by behavior technicians, but they're supervised by both the psychologist and the speech-language pathologist who develop the treatment plans. Our dietitian is monitoring their nutrition and caloric intake, and all of them had medical evaluation by our gastroenterologist prior to admission. So this table looks at their three of the kids, their micronutrients pre-post treatment. Anything highlighted in red is um, a deficiency. And as you can see, the first kiddo on there, she didn't have as many. She was the one who was eating the fortified um, cereal bars but she still had um, some deficiencies. Iron was a significant concern across the board for our kids. Um, so you can see, looking at this table, those concerns, and then also looking at their food variety, pre and post treatment, In the yellow is pre-treatment, the blue is post-treatment. Um, we've been able to expand the diets of these kids, uh, fruits, vegetables, starch, protein, dairy, across the board, significant differences. Um, following the program. And the case that we really want to highlight is we had an eight-year-old kiddo diagnosed with autism and ADHD, and he had severe food selectivity. He ate Lay's potato chips, drank blue Kool-Aid, and ate McDonald's french fries for years. And prior to his admission, the PCP was not as concerned because he was following a normal growth curve. And it, was, it wasn't until years of eating this way that he became very ill, started to have significant weight loss, started vomiting, he had difficulties walking. They took him to multiple EDs, different hospitals, trying to get treatment, and he was eventually life-flighted to our hospital. And he was admitted to our PICU, and you can see the significant um, deficiencies and medical complications that came from these nutritional deficiencies. Associated costs of his stay, he was intubated and was spent 36 days in the PICU, 28 days on the vent. He spent time on our general floor, time on our inpatient rehab. He had his G-tube placed and the helicopter life flight, all with no underlying medical cause for his selective eating. And the cost of his care when we actually um, dove into the data was over a million dollars for just this point. So he was placed on our urgent list and we got him into our program right away and he was able to master 16 foods and two fluids in 22 days of treatment with three or more foods from each food group. Um, his G-tube feeds were continued after 15 treatment days and he graduated after 24 treatment days in our program, all with an estimated cost of under $23,000 compared to 1.1 million. 30 seconds, please. So, just a highlight, perfect. Um, <laughs> that uh, the use of these behavioral feeding strategies was successful for all of these kids. Actually, all of these kids graduated prior to eight weeks, 
and we found that they were able to maintain their gains in outpatient follow-up visits. And then the big thing to highlight is that there are significant costs to these micronutrient deficiencies. Um, behavioral feeding can be very cost-effective and efficient and uh, way to address this because those costs can be medically significant and financially significant. Thanks.